Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome to the Farouk Mustafa uh, lecture series. Um, this lecture is serious, and in particular, uh, the spring lecture that you're attending right now is dedicated uh, to our friend and our colleague uh, Farouk Mustafa. Uh, an Egyptian American scholar who uh, was a gifted translator of Arabic prose um, and also dedicated uh, his um, academic career to teaching um, Arabic, to thinking about translation and also to um, guiding students who work on Arab intellectuals in the 20th century, uh, in the 19th century, who were translators themselves and were deeply interested uh, in the relationship um, between translation and literary production. Um, I wanna thank my colleagues at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, especially uh, Tom McGuire and Krishna for helping organize this event. Um, and as always, I'd like to thank uh, Kay Heikinen uh, for the role that she played in the initiating uh, this lecture. Uh, Kay is a translator herself, and I also want to congratulate her again for um, uh, winning the Banipal Award for her translation of uh, Velvet. I'd like to welcome you all for this uh, Zoom event. And uh, it gives me a great honor to introduce a scholar whose work uh, very much intersects in very productive and creative ways with the aims uh, that this lecture series is set out uh, to achieve. So today we're introducing to, um, to, uh, to you uh, the work of and, and the lecture of Barbara uh, Romain, uh, who is um, a translator of Arabic literature, a very famous translator uh, of Arabic literature who uh, teaches uh, in the Department of Global Interdisciplinary Studies at Villanova University. Um, and um, Barbara's work is engaged very deeply with, the, with translation, with thinking about uh, translation, and she is a translator herself, and her work, I, I've been going over uh, parts of it uh, uh, today, ranks from, you know, shafai to uh, the present, uh, but um, I just want to highlight uh, some of the major um, achievements in translation, which is um, um, the translation of uh, Bahata, her um, and Sophia and the monastery. Um, she's done incredible work on uh, Ghadwa Ashur, uh, who's also somebody uh, that is very dear to uh, people at uh, CMES. So Siraj, Spectres, um, and um, she's all and uh, blue lorries. Uh, she's also the translator of uh, Muhammad Nancy Qandil, A Cloudy Day uh, on the Western uh, Shore. Uh, she's the winner of several awards. She's been um, also uh, shortlisted for uh, several awards. Like many of the participants here, she uh, has been active uh, in Egypt uh, for uh, many years, having earned a fellowship from uh, AUC 1992 uh, 92 to 93. Um, and um, I should uh, just mention that she's also uh, that she won um, a decade ago uh, a national endowment for the art fellowship for the translation uh, of Spectres. So we are very very excited that she's here uh, to reflect with us, to think with us about translation, the work of the translator. Um, and Barbara, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for coming, and welcome all to the talk. Thank you so much, Oryd, for that very generous introduction. I'm very grateful and um, a little bit surprised by some of what I heard. Is that really me? <laughs> thank you. Um, and thank you also to Tom McGuire. And I also want to thank Holly Schisler, Dr. Holly Schisler. I don't know whether she's here, but for initiating the conversation about um, doing the lecture uh, a year ago, more than a year ago, she first approached me and thank you to the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Chicago. I'm very honored to speak for the Farouk Mustafa Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for being here. Whatever being here means these days. And before you get to the lecture itself, I have a couple of prefatory remarks, starting with a sort of disclaimer. Um, when I speak about translation, I address the topic from a purely experiential point of view rather than a scholarly one. So I won't be citing anyone's research, although I will be discussing, again, drawing entirely on my own experience. Um, 
some of the same kinds of things that translation theorists address, in particular the problem of what gets lost in translation, to use that very familiar expression. The other thing that I'd like to say at the outset is that I'm not completely happy with my title for this talk. I'm actually going to start by quarreling with my own title. It's kind of a mistranslation of what I had in mind, but I realized this far too late in the proceedings to ask that the title be changed. I didn't want to cause undue inconvenience to the organizers of the event. And now I find that I'm just as glad that things turned out the way they did because I'm going to take opportunistic advantage of my own mistake, if mistake is what you'd call it. Um, my issue is with the word deliberately because, or deliberate actually, because what does deliberate mean? It's, it implies or means really intention, I think. And in the process of literary translation, we don't set out to be inexact. We don't make that a goal. What I actually mean is that the inexactitude is going to happen, whether we like it or not. And if we're paying even the slightest attention, which we hope we are, um, we're gonna be perfectly aware, well aware that it's happening. So I think the second half of my title really should have been translation as a consciously imperfect art, not deliberately, because we aren't trying to be imper in, in, imperfect or inexact. We just can't help it in some sense. So having disposed of that preamble, I'll proceed. Um, in an Arab folk tradition, there's a character known as Juha who may be familiar to some of you, who features in numerous stories, some of them suitable for children, others framed more like jokes for adult audiences. Um, Jorha's nature is a bit ambiguous. Sometimes he's extremely clever and outwits everyone else on the scene. And at other times he's comically dull-witted or silly. And there's a simplified version of a particular tale that I sometimes use with my students, which goes more or less like this. Joha's wife needs to go to the market, so she tells Joha to guard the door while she's gone. Joha, however, gets restless, so he detaches the door from his frame, hefts it onto his back, and goes to market himself to see what's what. And his wife sees him there and asks him in astonishment, Joha, what are you doing here and why are you carrying the door? To which he replies, of course, you told me to guard it. And the humor naturally lies in Joha's absolute to the letter interpretation of his wife's utterance a translation error of sorts, even though it involves no interlingual, no, no interlingual transaction. So believe it or not, I have another story featuring a door. Years ago, an Egyptian woman I knew who spent a good deal of time living and working in the United States with her husband and daughters described an occasion when the doorbell rang and one of the girls said, Hagi bilbeb, I'll get the door. That literally means I'll get the door, except that in Egyptian dialect, this implied that she, as if, in as if she were following in Joha's venerable tradition, was about to go fetch the door and bring it back. She had spent enough time in an English-speaking milieu to absorb some fundamentals of English idiom, but hadn't got to the point where she could fully untangle the idiomatic nuances of the two languages that otherwise she spoke pretty fluently. So the foregoing examples represent problems of translation. The first is facetious, and yet I think it's telling as an illustration of the way in which we unconsciously translate material even within our own language. A nice illustration of a different sort of ambiguity may be found in English in Act 5, Scene 2 of Shakespeare's The Life of King Henry V, which is, I like to describe it as a lively convergence of politics, flirtation, and clever wordplay. And at a certain point, Henry, who is courting the French princess, I mean, evidently he likes her, but he's all, there's, all, there's also a strategic motive here. He, this is poli a political flirtation. He says, do you like me, Kate? To which she replies, pardonnez-moi, I cannot tell what is like me. At this, Henry is not about to miss the opportunity for a pun that may advance his cause. And he comes back with, an angel is like you, Kate, and you are like an angel, isn't he slick? prompting Catherine, after consultation with Alice, her lady-in-waiting, to declare that the tongues of men are plein de tromperies, translated by Alice as full of deceits. The Egyptian child who inadvertently announced her intention to go fetch the door and King Henry with his strategic verbal agility illustrate for us the challenges and apparently the opportunities that figurative language may present to the partially or aspirationally bilingual. So from here, I'd like to proceed by pitching you a small exercise, something like a thought experiment. 
and this talk is about translation and I'll get more into that, but the title is on not getting it right. So I wanna start by addressing in general terms, not getting it right, or to put it another way, the inevitability of imprecision. I open the first beginner Arabic class I teach every year with a discussion of idiom. The majority of my students have grown up monolingual, which means that even if they've studied another language in high school, their grasp of the nuanced thinking required in navigating between languages may be quite limited. So I wanna nip in the bud if I can, any notion of exact equivalence between expressions in two languages. I'm gonna use here the same favorite example I routinely introduced to those first year students. It's a sentence that I think is kind of clever as an illustration of the problems of idiom. I want to say not just the problems, but I don't know, the, the fascination of idiom, the fascination that lies in idiom. So what I'd like you to do is imagine that you're in conversation with a non-native speaker of English whose command of the language still falls pretty well short of native proficiency and whose mother tongue you do not speak. This person, and I hope nobody minds if I assign her a binary gender so I don't get to ensnarl in pronouns, which I'm sure I would, <laughs> has read or overheard the expression, I can't seem to get the hang of this. Now, for whatever reason, context has been insufficient to unravel the expression for her, so she's been left wondering what the sentence means. She knows what each individual word means. It's in the aggregation of them that the mystery lies. How are you gonna explain it to her? Assuming her English is at least moderately proficient, it shouldn't be very difficult. Presumably you'll offer an explanation to the effect that the words get the hang of this are a weird way of saying, figure this out or develop a facility with this. Depending on her own approach to language and her apprehension of idiom, she may then probe a little further by asking what hang has to do with any of it. At which point you can either refer her to Google or tell her what you found there yourself if it occurred to you to chase this one down. And believe it or not, after something like two decades of pestering my students with this sentence, only this year did I think to consult Google. Now, not surprisingly, what I found is that there are differing theories ranging from a possible etymological connection with the dialect word hank, meaning habituation to something that was new to me. I'd never heard of that. To the hanging of curtains, to the fitting of, an, of a handle on an ax, a process that apparently involves suspending the ax in some fashion in order to ensure that the handle will serve the best possible ergonomic advantage or so I infer. And of course, there's a good chance that the conversation with your interlocutor, your interlocutor won't send you down this particular forked path that she simply wanted to know what was meant by the phrase. The explanation that we've offered to our imaginary person may at this point have met the necessary requirements, but we're not finished with the sentence or it's not finished with us. So I ask you now to re-examine the whole utterance. I can't seem to get the hang of this. When I instruct my students to spot the idiom here, they easily identify the word hang as the figurative element, and so it is. But of course, idiom isn't only about metaphors and other such figures of speech, it's also about quirks. And I used the word quirks once with a colleague of mine who's an Arab, Arabic linguist, and he bristled <laughs> as if I were accusing Arabic of being peculiarly quirky, which I wasn't. Language is quirky, and if you happen to be a person who enjoys thinking about language, the quirkiness is part of what makes it so enchanting. So what else does our sentence contain that might be pegged as idiomatic? Well, you may already have noticed that there's an inversion contained in the two words can't seem that arguably defies logic. If you rephrase I can't seem, what you get is I am unable to give an appearance of, which it's reasonably safe to assume is not what you mean when you say I can't seem to get the hang of this. You don't mean I am unable to give an appearance of figuring this out, which would suggest that you were hoping to bluff your way through, but you didn't get away with it. What you must surely mean is I appear to be unable to figure this out or to, be, to depersonalize it a bit. It seems I am unable to figure this out. How did the inversion happen and how did it come to be accepted so that as we learn English, whether as native or non-native speakers, we internalize probably unthinkingly the inversion as meaning what it does not actually mean. I looked this one up too, but that inquiry took me down a rabbit hole that didn't in my view lead to any very satisfactory explanations. 
and none in any, in any case that effect, effectively challenged my long-held conviction that language by its very nature cannot be pinned down and there is a great deal that has to be taken on faith. A beloved Arabic teacher of mine in Egypt when we badgered her with questions as to rules that had been relentlessly drummed into us only to be summarily defied by the literati whose works we were eventually fluent enough to read would reply with great and gentle composure in nahada min al as'ila allati la tus'al which is to say this is one of the questions that are not asked or more bluntly don't ask in this sentence she applied one of those rules we would see or had seen casually violated we thought by distinguished writers not to mention the quran which means it's actually not a violation but that's a whole other discussion and the rule I'm referring to is that in modern standard Arabic, as opposed to contemporary dialects whose grammatical systems vary, non-human plural nouns are treated for purposes of agreement as feminine singular. As far as I know, this grammatical phenomenon is unique to Arabic, not found even in other Semitic languages, but I can't swear to that. There may be people you know, attending this lecture who know more about that than I do. The literati, I tell my students, know what they're doing. They're operating on a different level from us. And when and if we get there, we too can bend the rules or rules. But for now, if you forget the non-human plural rule on a quiz or a test, it will cost you points. I had a French teacher a long time ago who was startled when one of her students translated something like, je suis sur la liste, n'est-ce pas? As something like, I'm on the list, aren't I? The professor rebelled against the idea of this as accepted English usage and who could blame her? It has to be Amantai, she insisted. And at our next class, she told us she had consulted her husband who was American. You were right, she said, shaking her head rather sadly, I thought. Before I proceed to a discussion of literary translation, I wanna bring in one more example of the slipperiness of language. This one having less to do with idiom per se than with simple subjectivity. I introduce it with apologies to the men in the audience. It's a feminist Christmas card sent to me in 2019 by a longtime woman friend. And I'm gonna see if I can get it up on screen share. Uh-oh, let me see, hang on, wait a minute. I may not be able to do this. If not, I'll just explain it. Yeah, I'm not seeing it in the window for, for the screen share, and I'm not sure why that is. But in any case, um, the when you look at the front of the card, it says three wise men. I'm not putting any emphasis on that for a reason. And you open it up and it says, be serious. So I had a conversation about this card with a colleague in which I posited that at least in theory, you could infer any one of three different emphases in the setup for the joke. In other words, three wise men, three wise men, three wise men. Her position was that the last of these was obviously what was meant. And I'd go so far as to say that that does seem to be the one that suggests itself most readily. And suggestion number one can perhaps be eliminated from the running, but I'm not convinced that number two, three wise men, three wise men, that needs to be a question, might not find some takers. In spoken language, the question wouldn't arise, of course, but as a translator of literature, I work from the page. Even within the borders of a single language, we're not all navigating by identical maps, which means that some hey, number of us may start out on the same path without all arriving at the same destination, particularly where there are no signposts, none of the gesture or vocal inflection that may help cue our understanding of a spoken utterance. This brings me to the actual business of literary translation, literary as distinct from the practical kind, instruction pamphlets, for instance, although even strictly pragmatic translation may have its subtleties and its potential pitfalls as anyone knows who's tried to decipher an enclosure that came with a new appliance, say, rendered in only approximate English. I imagine that what I've been driving at up to this point is already to some extent self-evident, namely that you have to go into literary translation knowing that you're not going to get it right, as my title implies, which naturally begs the question of how far wrong you can go without doing violence to the source text. And offhand, I'd say, in the words of my teacher in Egypt, that is one of those questions that are not asked 
I'd say that the question isn't answerable if you frame it that way, not least of all because literature is an, as impossible to pin down as language itself. So in taking on a literary translation project, you may be walking into a beehive, and I'm gonna beat that metaphor to death just to warn you now. <laughs> How aggressive the bees are depends largely on the nature of the text. I say kudos to anyone who can produce an eloquent translation of experimental fiction or avant-garde poetry. Those are beehives into which, as a translator, I will not venture. I would not, for example, undertake to translate the poetry of Adonis or the prose of Sana'a al-Abrahim. They deal, deal in abstractions and experimental language with which I'm not sufficiently comfortable. So I'd say that right up front. Now, the play it safe approach doesn't, of course, guarantee that I won't get blindsided. And that's even if I've read carefully before getting to work, whatever it is I've set out to translate, usually a novel. The gap between reading and comprehending a text and recasting that same text for the comprehension and appreciation of others who do not know the source language shouldn't be underestimated. Much has been said and written about faithfulness to the source text in the act of translation. But I'm not sure anyone really knows what that means. My own basic rule is pretty simple. I actually start with the premise that I owe something to my own language, the one I'm translating into, and what I owe to it is that it be as graceful as possible. But by graceful, I don't mean that it can't be rude or harsh or even nauseating. It can be any of these. It may have to be one of these things. As long, but it's, but, and it can be as long as it's, it's for the right reasons, which is to say because the Arabic content calls for it, not because the English is being poorly handled. My basic rule implies another, namely that I have to know my own limits. I've already addressed the matter of choosing the beehives you're willing to approach. There's the beehive again. But the other thing is knowing when to ask for help. And in that connection, I'd like to talk for a few minutes about my current project using an, an excerpt that I hope will effectively illustrate a number of the kinds of decisions a translator confronts and how the attendant questions are resolved. On the supposition, well, let me interrupt myself here for a second. I, since I can't get a slide up, I'm gonna do this a little bit differently from the way that I planned. I was gonna put this up on the screen. Um, the, to give you a little bit of background, the novel is, the title of it is Mese Ya'ti, What Will Come, and it's by an Iraqi writer, Hadiya Hussein. And it concerns a young woman who ducks the authorities in Saddam era Baghdad to go in search of the man she loves who's been disappeared by the regime. She fetches up in Kurdistan where she's taken in by a series of Kurdish families staying much longer than she ever foresaw. She's living with a family in a mountain village when the regime falls. And uh, the passage in question is her description of the moment in which this event takes place. And I took some liberties with the translation. Um, so for instance, the, the, first, the first part of it is, and I translated that at last the earthquake quick earthquake struck struck with a resounding crash and a more uh, sort of dictionary oriented approach would have would have yielded something like at last the earthquake happened stupefying reverberating so I did what I thought sounded a little bit more like idiomatic English there rather than go straight with uh, with what I would have gotten out of the dictionary. Um, but that, you know, so far so good. I wasn't having a lot of trouble with things up to about the middle of the paragraph. But then there was a, a metaphor that the author employed to refer to people who had suffered in not only, not only under Saddam, but also in the aftermath of his fall, which I think is something that's less understood uh, by many of us in this country, you know, the, 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 how gruesome it really was for a whole long, whole, a long time. I mean, arguably to this day, that it you know didn't just solve everything when Saddam Hussein fell. Um, that in fact that opened a whole whole new set of problems. And so she uses this expression, "awled al khayba," and it's not khayba, but khayba, which was not a word that I had seen before. I'm familiar with khayba as meaning something like disappointment, um, but the insertion of that elif thrusts the translator into territory that I don't think is covered by the usual dictionaries. And I struggled with it for an hour or so, um, not satisfied with, with what I came up with. Certainly children of disappointment sounded lame 
given the enormity of what the Iraqi people had been suffering, both under Saddam and post Saddam. And I also wasn't sure that that was really what it meant. So children of disappointment didn't sound right. Awlad al-Khayba, children of disappointment just didn't seem like the right thing. So I, I translated it, the children of calamity. But I wasn't completely happy with that either. And finally, I consulted an Iraqi native speaker. And uh, he didn't exactly, he wasn't able to answer the question for me completely or solve the solve the, the dilemma completely, but he did at least let me know that I'd been right to question the word. Um, he said that children of calamity was, was getting at it. He thought the word calamity might be a little too strong, whereas I thought disappointment was too weak. And I'll, I'll come to what I decided on in a, in a moment. But the word khayba is loaded according to his description. What he told me was that khayba refers to a deposed wife, which is to say a wife who, who, uh, who's been married upon, as it were, that's uh, the expression in, in Moroccan Arabic so suddenly came to me there. In other words, her husband has married another woman after her. The implication is that the children of the deposed wife automatically suffer because they're shunted into the background. Meanwhile, it's assumed that the new object of infatuation will produce children of her own who may end up being the favorites, particularly if the woman who bears them can maintain her own favored wife status. So you see my difficulty. I was not gonna get this one right. You can't smuggle all that over the linguistic border. You just can't, I don't think. I mean, I, I freely admit that I was not prepared even to attempt to transport all that cultural freight from the source language into English. For one thing, I, I, as I say, I don't know how it could be done gracefully to come back to that particular priority of mine. And for another, even if I could do it, I think it would distract from rather than serve the salient features of this particular passage. Maybe you could use a footnote or something like that. I don't know whether that even that would be a good idea. Another translator might come to a different decision, might even solve the problem ingeniously. You know, I'm more than happy to acknowledge that possibility too. But as for me, my native speaker consultant mostly approved of what I'd come up with, what I had come up with, except the fact that, as I said, he thought calamity might be too forceful. And so I suggested misfortune and that met with no objection. I'm still fiddling with the word order. And I recently decided that I like, rather than so many children of misfortune, which is what I originally had, well, after children of calamity, um, I decided on so many of misfortune's children. And the reason for this, I think, has to do with my colleague's explanation of the phrase in question. The word al khaybar is meant to conjure at least subliminally a living, breathing, suffering woman. And the phrase misfortune's children seems to me to go just a little further toward anthropomorphizing misfortune than the slightly more formally constructed children of misfortune. Not everyone perhaps will agree. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying about how no two translators are gonna come up, we're gonna make the same decisions. So. Um, I either already said that or I'm going to say it, I can't remember. So, so what about a reverse scenario? A figurative word or phrase in English that is instantly comprehensible to most, if not all English speakers, but that can't be brought into another language without the loss of some layers of meaning. As an example, we could return to get the hang of this. And for fun, I looked the phrase up in Google Translate for French and for Arabic. Google Translate, of course, is notorious for pitfalls, but that's part of what's fun about using it sometimes. You can see what it's going to give you. So for French, for get the hang of this, I got comprendre. In other words, Google dispensed with the metaphor and gave a literal alternative. And for Arabic, I got el hosul ala ta'liq min heda which mystified me. I know the word ta'liq as meaning comment, but it does fundamentally have to do with suspending something, whether physically or conceptually. al husul ala is obtaining. So basically what Google came up with here is obtaining, subs obtaining suspension from this. You tell me what they want, what they meant by that. At any rate, with or without Google Translate, there's probably no way of carrying the phrase get the hang of this over into another language in anything like its original fully nuanced condition. Given that most English speakers themselves are probably unaware of the etymological hypotheses as to the phrase's origins, it hardly seems to matter like a matter of great importance to try to convey these hypotheses to speakers of other languages. Although it may be helpful in general to find a translation that is at least colorful in something of the way the original is whatever extent that's possible, depending on the context and 
possibly other factors as well. So setting aside hangs and hanks and axes suspended from the rafters, I gave a lot of thought to phrases in English that might be used metaphorically that would constitute for native speakers of English an instantly recognizable reference, but that would not lend themselves to direct translation. I rejected quite a few as being conceptually too familiar to too many speakers of various foreign languages, but one example that may serve is baby boomer. The metaphorically applied boom, of course, refers to an explosion. So a baby boom is a specific type of population explosion. Part of the catchiness of the expressions baby boom and baby boomer, I think, is their, alliter their alliterative quality. But boom is a pretty forceful word. And getting anything like its equivalent into another language without making it sound like violence against children is tricky. I decided to give Google Translate another try. I put baby boom in for Arabic and got tafwat al-mawalid. A little further investigation established that this is indeed the Arabic phrase for baby boom. It's got a Wikipedia page. But while mawalid means newborns, tafwa means buoyancy. So buoyancy of the newborns. Interesting. I put baby boom in for French and got baby boom. I put it in for Russian and I got the untranslated phrase as a Cyrillic transliteration. I put it in for Greek. And as soon as I added boom after baby, the Greek characters disappeared, didn't show up anymore. And I got the same thing as with French, baby boom in Roman in the Roman alphabet. So I stopped there deciding that this was sufficient to establish that the phrase baby boom is indeed a dodgy one to put into other languages, even if Google Translate is notoriously unreliable. A still better example though, I think, is cockney rhyming slang. Apples and pears for stairs, ones and twos for shoes, scotch mist for pissed, inebriated that is, possibly on scotch mist and quite a host of others, including some very indecent ones. The thing is, as a translator, what are you gonna do if you find yourself confronted with a British text featuring say characters who speak this particular jargon that you are tasked with transforming into another language, pretty much any other language? My answer is I have no idea. Or to put it another way, thank heavens, I'm not the translator who is required to render in Slovak or something, the man's a bloody Burke. And I thought about that particular one, which is short for Berkeley Hunt. And if you call someone a Berkeley Hunt, you've called them something pretty nasty. But I was thinking about layers of vernacularity, if that's a word, if it wasn't, it is now. Um, and the way, and I, I read something about Cockney rhyming slang to the effect that, well, it was actually about this particular expression. I mean, I was thinking about the ways that it can, in some cases, be a euphemism, which there, in a sense, it is, because it avoids the use of the actual term for which Hunt stands in. But the shortening of it to Burke apparently has kind of tidied it up so that it no longer necessarily has the same force that it did in its full, in its, its fully expanded form. And it can mean just something more like he's a fool. So I thought that was, I thought that was kind of fascinating. In any event, I think um, Cockney rhyming slang and putting it into some other language is one of those beehives I wouldn't wander into. Or if I did, I think I would have to accept that the results that I would get from working with Cockney rhyming slang in that way would to have to be an enormous compromise with the loss of a lot of cultural content and local color. And it would be kind of sad in a way. But leaving aside uh, extreme examples like this one, I pose the question, does not getting it right by default mean getting it wrong? And I don't think so. There are so many variables in play that to hold the process to any very rigid standard seems to me like in itself getting it wrong. For one thing, it's always the case that no two translators will produce the same rendering of an extended literary work. The whole process is just too subjective, too heavily informed by the translator's own background and yes, biases. Even individual translators may change their approaches and their focus over time. As we've seen, it's also the case that readers or listeners may not all receive material in the same way. At the moment, I'm looking at a novel about Palestine featuring an elderly man whom people keep pestering to give his personal account of Palestinian defeat and displacement upon the founding of Israel. He repeatedly and irascibly refuses. You want to know what happened, he says? Ba'ath Philistine. 
And on its surface, this two word sentence means simply Palestine was lost. And my husband, a native Arabic speaker, thinks that would suffice as a translation, but it's been bothering me. If my husband is right, and he may be, then it's because we can understand that the old man's point is that the story cannot be told. The tragedy and loss are beyond any teller's ability to put them into words. What I predict would happen if the translator of this work did decide to stick with the more or less direct rendering, Palestine was lost, is that individual readers would respond to it in very different ways. Palestinians may readily grasp what underlies those three words in Arabic is just two, so even more succinct. In perhaps a less visceral way, so may Westerners familiar with the history of the region. But readers coming to the work with less historical background may simply see the sentence as an expression of the old man's obstinacy, his defiance of those who keep pestering him to talk. And those readers won't be wrong. They simply won't have a fully developed apprehension of the tragedy that the old man in the story has determined language is inadequate to express. So as a translator, which readership should I try harder to accommodate? My husband says I should accommodate him. So <laughs> if I were to translate this work, then it would be one of those cases in which I'd had the luxury of, of consulting the author who is fluent in English. And this has been the case with at least two, or two other authors whose works I've translated. And in some ways this arrangement constitutes the ideal collaboration since it gives the writer a chance to weigh in on whether his or her intention has been at least adequately rendered in a second language from, from the standpoint, not only of words and expressions, but also of style. I'll come back to that, to, to style in just a moment. But first I wanna to touch on something I've been asked numerous times, which is why don't writers fluent in English translate their own books? Well, sometimes they do, of course. I've never put that question to any writer I've worked with. My own feeling is that in general, they're right to want their work translated into English by native speakers of English, simply because fluent and native are not necessarily the same. Although there are those in whom the two may be brought to converge, take Jehumpa Lahiri, if I'm pronouncing her name right, for example, I'm very jealous of her. She learned Italian as an adult and actually got good enough at it to write and publish literary work in that language. And so, I mean, I think it's very, I think it's probably safe to say she's an outlier and I'm guessing that doesn't happen too often. Hats off to her in any case. But to come back to what I said a moment ago about style, this is another way in which a translator may get it wrong. And it's one that matters perhaps more than questions of how to convert idiom. My first full length publication was Bahat Tahir's Khalti Safiya with Dair and Safiya in the monastery, whose translation the author himself supervised closely. Before he agreed to let me translate the novel, he knew I was I was completely green that I you know so I was just starting out in translation. Before he agreed to let me do it, he received from me a sample section into which I had poured I thought all my eloquence, all the verbal power I had at my disposal. And he was annoyed. No, no, no! He scolded me after what I after reading what I'd showed him. Why have you used all this exalted language? He said. I wanted the prose to be direct and straightforward, not elaborate and complex. And I was devastated. Do you want to find another translator? I asked, fully expecting him to say, yes, I'm afraid so. But he replied more gently, why don't you let me see another attempt? So I went back to the drawing board, shortening my sentences, simplifying the language, trying very hard for direct and accessible. And to my relief, he liked the second version much better and I was unable to proceed. But I'm left wondering to what extent I may, with texts whose authors couldn't assess my English, have produced renditions stylistically at variance with the writer's intentions. One cannot necessarily rely on copy editors to address this, particularly if those editors know only the language into which a text has been translated, which I think is pretty often the case. And I've dealt with editors who've wanted to make free with an author's works in ways I felt were an outrage against the original. There's a particular press that's not a going concern anymore that employed at least one editor who seemed determined to relocate large swaths of text, repositioning key narrative passages somewhere other than where the author had put them and put them there presumably for good reason. And when this was proposed for a novel I had placed with that press, I simply refused because I felt that it was an indefensible and rather presumptuous subversion of authorial intention. 
But subsequently, I was engaged to review a translation published by that press. And in the novel under review, I said I discovered they'd gotten away with it. The narrative had been reordered and had suffered this treatment at the sacrifice, I thought, of some of its dramatic tension. I, I'll never know why they, why they wanted to do that. I didn't know why they wanted to do it with the, the, the work that I was translating or why they wanted to do it with this one, with the one I reviewed. In the rendering of a text in a new language, some loss may be a necessary part of the transaction, but in my view, that kind of loss is unnecessary and uncalled for. It's important for a translator to try to retain some control over the editing process, but that doesn't always turn out well. I know of at least one case in which the author of the original work got sucked into the agenda being pushed by the copy editor and the publishers, and all of them effectively teamed up against the translator with the result that the English rendition that was eventually published was one with, with which the translator later said she would have preferred not to have her name associated. I try above all to approach my own translation work with humility, respecting both the Arabic and the English, and trying to balance my care for each of them as well as I can to pleasing aesthetic effect. Respect for the author of the original is of course a given, and if that author knows English, this may also involve the further dimension of receptivity to challenges from that quarter, and the need sometimes to find a middle ground. As we've seen, that effort can backfire, but I can't say that in my experience it ever has. Um, I'll conclude by saying that I hope I've left you with more questions than answers. There's a quote by the Czech writer Milan Kundera that I love and have cited in other contexts, including the introduction to one of my, transla one of my translations, to the effect that the stupidity of human beings is in having an answer for everything, while the wisdom of the novel is in having a question for everything. With the phrase, the stupidity of human beings, I've always assumed him to be referring to ideology and that he means that it's the job of art to counter with uncertainty, which is truthful, the mindless certainties of ideology, which are false. And what I'm doing with this talk is expository rather than artistic, of course, but I think we can extrapolate from Kundera's remarks, especially where literary translation is concerned. And perhaps this is as good a way as any to open up the question and answer session, in which I make no promises to have answers for your questions, but by all means ask away. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming, our faculty, our students, our prospective students, everybody who came, everybody who asked questions. Oh, I'm honored and thank you. Bye everybody.